so what I've got, I've just got a quick little diagram. Hopefully this is going to help us out. Um, to me, this looks backwards, so I do apologise if this is backwards to you as well. Um, but essentially, what I'm going to assume is that uh, we're going to have uh, maybe our acid um, is going to be our unknown and then our base is going to be our known or our standard if you like so um, our, we're going to make up pretend we're going to make up a um, uh, a, a primary standard or make up a standard solution of our base in our volumetric flask and then we put that base into our burette and then we titrate it with our unknown acid that's what I'm going to assume that we've, we've got going on here so um, so uh, what what I'm going to um, start with is uh, the potential for errors when we're making up our primary standard. So if you do uh, chemistry at school and, and you've got your teacher, usually um, a lot of your standards and things like that are pre-prepared. So that's probably the first first thing that the part of the phase that you don't sort of see when you're actually um, doing your titration. So consider the fact that you are going to be, um, if you were doing this yourself, you would make up the, the standard solution yourself. So the, the sources of error there are pretty uh, standard. So um, errors in uh, uh, weighing out your solid, whatever that may be. It could be that you don't make your solution up to the, the mark up here um, very well. You could, um, if your volumetric flask is old, it could um, not measure exactly what it says it does. So there are a few uh, small sources of error. Um, one that I can think of, so if you use uh, uh, sodium hydroxide as your standard here, you can actually, um, if you've ever seen sodium hydroxide, which I don't think I ever saw it till I was in about second year of uni, but sodium hydroxide is a solid which uh, is very what we call hydroscopic or hygroscopic. So what it does is it absorbs water out of the air. And so um, if you imagine that you were going to leave some of that out on the bench, um, that potentially could cause you dramas because if you left it out for a week and then you went to use it, you'd probably notice that it was just a, a lump of goo on the bottom of your container, which is not what we want. So um, if you imagine you went and tried to weigh that and make your standard solution up, uh, then you'd probably find out that uh, you're weighing more water than sodium hydroxide, which is not what we want for a standard solution. So remember that our standard, standard solution is going to be a solution that we know the concentration of very very accurately so uh, obviously when you use your primary standard which is in this case uh, the example is sodium hydroxide you really want that primary standard to be in the best condition that you you can uh, buy it and that you've kept it in that condition i.e you've not let it um, absorb any water out of out of the atmosphere so that's that's i guess in terms of making up your standard solution um, is uh, what sort of that that's where the errors are here um, then we go into uh, if we've got our standard solution made up in our volumetric flask if we transfer it to our burette um, there's not a lot of error sources of error there because you, you're essentially looking at um, transferring that liquid into there um, and it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you don't change the concentration of it. Now, uh, something that comes up a lot in SACs or exams when you're talking about uh, titrations is rinsing of your glassware. So obviously that's where we find the sources of error in a lot of these things. Um, so if we have, say, rinsed our burette with... Uh, uh, so we're putting base into our burette if we rinsed it with water then you can think about it logically the concentration of what is in your burette is going to decrease ever so slightly and it may be only very slight okay but it's probably enough for you to change your your titer or your the volume that you measure out uh, to do your titration so um, so that's sort of that's something you need to think of. So so if you've diluted your your solution, your burette, 
then what that means is you need ever so slightly a little bit more of that solution in order to uh, get your color change down here in your conical flask. Um, so that's always, you know, when you're thinking about your errors in your titrations, you really want to uh, think about the fact that, well, what is it going to do to my titer? Okay, and then you can extrapolate back from that what it's going to do to your titer. Um, so then imagine that we have our sample, and remember our sample is going to be an, un an acid of unknown concentration. Um, quite often uh, it could be potentially, um, uh, could be already in the right concentration to do your titration with it straight away, in which case you would just use your volumetric pipette to measure out, it's usually 20 or 25 mils into your conical flask here. Um, so uh, there is the potential there again for considering uh, the rinsing of your volumetric pipette. Um, so let's consider that we've rinsed our volumetric pipette with water, okay, with no other rinses with your sample then uh, again it would dilute the amount of liquid in your volumetric pipette. So that would be uh, decreasing the number of moles in your volumetric pipette and then it would decrease the number of moles in your elamine flask and that would also mean that your, you would need a, a slightly lower tighter uh, uh, in, to neutralise that acid. Um, so that's sort of uh, where I'm looking at there. Um, when we when we look at the rinsing of our, our conical flask or Earl and Meyer flask there, um, so that's this one here. Um, so you always want to rinse uh, the conical flask with water, okay? Some people will sort of think, oh, but hang on, that's going to dilute our solution here. What you've got to remember is that your your titration is based on the number of moles, not on the concentration here. So, um, so quite often, like if you're actually doing a titration and you uh, if you get a little little splashes on the outside of the conical flask, what you can do is actually uh, get uh, some water and rinse it down the side so that you know that the number all of the moles that are in that conical flask are rinsed down into your titration ready for your um, for your reaction okay so and you can do that mid mid titration as well it doesn't matter because as long as you've got all of your moles in this solution here of, of your acid then your, the number of moles you need for your base is going to be exactly correct um, so in terms of rinsing of your glassware you, you want to rinse your conical flask with water you want to rinse any volumetric flasks that you use with water because um, you know you'll either, you'll usually be diluting something. So if you're diluting your standard solution or you're diluting your sample, you're always diluting it with water. So if you rinse that before you start using, if you make sure it's nice and clean with water, then that's not going to affect your results. So these two here, um, we would consider to. Uh, rinse with water and then the two long ones so this is how some people remember it the the long um, pieces of equipment you rinse with whatever solution that you are using so in the case of the burette uh, you would rinse with whatever s solution that you are using and consider the fact that also there's sometimes water can get stuck underneath the tap there so you always definitely want to um, want to make sure that you run through whatever solution you've got in your burette you want to run it all the way through the burette including past the tap so you have a little waste container at the bottom to make sure that that solution in the burette is representative of the standard solution that you have prepared previously um, also in terms of your volumetric pipette um, whatever solution that you're measuring with that you want to rinse it uh, the volumetric pipette um, with that solution a couple of times a to remove if you've had to clean it from someone else using it you might clean it with water but then you'd rinse it with whatever solution you're using so again your your representative solution inside of this volumetric pipette is going to be of the same concentration and give you an accurate number of moles in that in that volumetric pipette for use 
Um, the other thing for you to consider, so uh, all of this glassware is, especially the, the volumetric pipette and the burette, are uh, considered to be um, uh, very, very accurate. And, and so they're, they're calibrated on, on the knowledge that you, um, you are using the, all of this glassware is, is calibrated on, on the fact that you would be using it at approximately room temperature, which is 20 to 25 degrees. I think they're all calibrated for 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing, which I, I actually didn't learn till I got to uni, but um, when you're using a burette and a volumetric pet, when you're draining those those pieces of equipment, what you want to do, some people will will have their pipettes on a on an angle this way. Okay, what you want to do when you're draining those solutions is you actually have them vertical because they're calibrated to drain as if they were perfectly vertical. So that's another potential source of error. I mean, it, it doesn't uh, make a huge difference, but you'll be aware that when you use volumetric pipettes that there's a tiny little amount of liquid left at the bottom and that tiny little um, liquid left at the bottom changes depending on the angle that you have that volumetric pipette. So if you're draining it sort of on this kind of angle, you're not going to drain it as efficiently and as uh, sorry, it, uh, as effectively as when you, if it, it was completely vertical. Um, also, when, you, when you're holding on an angle, like you want to be able to drain these pipettes and get um, the same, you, you want concordant results. So uh, the other thing you can consider is that you, you want those results concordant. You want to drain that pipette, even if you do do it on an angle, you want to drain that pipette in the same way every time so that you get concordant results. So if you've got it vertical, you don't even have to consider what angle you're holding it at because it's always vertical and that never changes. So that's the, the other reason why you're best to hold them vertical. Um, so I think I've kind of covered it. So kind of in summary, um, we always want to rinse uh, our long skinny pieces of uh, equipment with uh, whatever solutions that going into them. And then the other pieces of equipment, uh, we always rinse with water. I guess the other thing, I mean, I've, I've said to you uh, to, you know, consider what, what effect it has on your tighter and, and extrapolate back from there. Always remember that you've got to consider whether you've got a, a simple titration or a back titration. So a simple titration is going to be for uh, one chemical reaction and then our back titration, remember, has our two chemical reactions that happen. And so uh, let me use an example. If we were to uh, have an increased titer, when we do our stoichiometry back to uh, our unknown, um, the dig, did I say increased? Increased titer is going to increase the number of moles of whatever that is. Let's say it's our, our unknown acid. And then it would increase the num the calculations for the number of moles of your of your base. So um, so say but when you go to a back titration if you have an increased titer, what that means is you've got an increased number of moles of your excess reagent. Remember, when you're back titration, you actually add extra and then you titrate whatever's left over. So if you have um, an increased titer, that means an increased excess number of moles of your acid or base. When you extrapolate that back, it'll actually mean that it would look like you've got less number of moles of your original component. So when you're looking at um, simple titrations, it's a direct correlation. If you've got an increased titer, you've got an increased number of moles, and then you extrapolate back to an increased number of moles of your unknown. Whereas your back titration, you're looking at uh, a, a, an increase, increased titer means an increased number of excess, which means you've got less of your um, left uh, less of what you're looking for so that's an inverse correlation there so um, so that's essentially uh, what I've got for you today <laughs>